Netflix? Ja. Dan hoor je iets minder de echo, ben ik inmiddels achter. Uh, kijk, kijk rustig even rond. Ik neem nog een slokje van mijn cacao. Ik zit helemaal in de Costa Ricaanse sferen. Ja, heel goed jongen. Cacao. Mooi ding hoor. Ah, hier. Gaat zo. Okay. Ja, hoor je mij? Ja, ik hoor je. Hoor je mij ook? Top, 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 top. Ik vind dit, uh, dit vind ik zo mooi van ondernemer dat je gewoon... Het is echt take it to you make it. Wij zijn gewoon twee dudes die nu bepalen dit te gaan doen. En dan gaan we dat publiceren. Zo goed toch? Zo goed. Zo goed. Zo kitchen. Zo kitchen. Zo kitchen. Recepten creëren. Dat is toch grappig? We flikken er wat in. En dan serveren het alsof we dit al jaren doen. Ja. Zo goed. Zo goed. Zo goed. Heerlijk man. Heerlijk. Heerlijk. Ja, echt, uh... hey, voordat we gaan beginnen. Hoe was de vision? Ja. Ja, echt mooi. Het is allemaal goed, ge- het is allemaal goed gekomen. Dus, dus ik, ik heb mijn ticket wel moeten omboeken met het gele kortvaccin naar Argentinië. Ja. Dat is een duur geintje, maar ik zat er ook weer niet heel lang mee dat ik dacht, ja, dit, dit is de price you pay als je niet op de details let, zeg maar. Ja. Toch? Ja, dat, dat ja. krijg je even om je oren. Ja. Maar een beetje was wel echt heel mooi. Het is wel... Uh... Het heeft echt iets utopisch. Net als Burning Man, waar dat in die jungle is en... Iedereen komt overal vandaan. En dat je ook afvraagt, wat doen al deze mensen? Dat heb ik bij Burning Man ook af en toe. Dat je denkt, hoe ja, leven ja, 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 ja. deze mensen? Ja, ja. Maar iedereen lijkt het wel voor elkaar te hebben of zo. Of in ieder geval, het maakt ook niet zo uit of zo. Um, en uh, ja, gewoon veel inspiratie. En er was bijvoorbeeld dan een Momentum Collective. Dat is een artiestengroep die dan rondreist. En je had een andere stage. Dus je hebt wel van die... Um, Echt van die artiestencollectieven die ook veel de content dan verzorgen. Ja. Maar ik kwam er daar een beetje achter. Die doen dat dan ook wereldwijd. Hè? Dus die, die, die struinen eigenlijk een beetje rond. Ik vroeg me op een gegeven moment af. Wie zijn eigenlijk al die artiesten? Ja. Hmm. Dus het was, was erg mooi. Ik heb ja. ook wel uh, meer drugs gebruikt dan ik bij Burning Man heb gedaan. Want ik ben er iets makkelijker in geworden. Ik was vroeger er vrij conservatief in. Maar nu heb ik me iets meer laten gaan. Dit gaat eens even off the record hoor, maar doe jij dat makkelijk of ben je daar constructief in? Nee, nee, nee joh, ik heb echt, ik heb, ik heb, ik heb een eindeloze floor uh, in, in mijn eerste twee Burning Man's, was echt elke dag uh, was het raak. Um, ja, gewoon gaan met de flow, als het goed voelt, voelt het goed. Ja, 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 ja dat, dat, uh, ja, maar van de eerste twee Burning Man's, die waren echt heftig. Die waren echt elke dag gewoon, gewoon MDMA. Ja. En gewoon echt gewoon de hele dag gewoon, gewoon, gewoon naar parties eigenlijk. Gewoon de hele tijd op zoek naar die volgende dopamine rush eigenlijk. Ja. Dat was het. Ja. En, 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 en de jaren daarna wat iets wat meer gematigd. En dat, dat beviel beter eigenlijk. Ja. ja, dat kan ik me voorstellen. Ja. ja. ja maar en Vision was hartstikke goed. En um, ik had daarna even een dipje. Maar ik zit nu wel in een leuke community. Ja. Gewoon een groep. Je hebt vijf uur s ochtends, vijf uur s middags is er meditatie. En uh, er is gezond eten. En ik kan hier lekker mijn werk doen. Ja. Daar word ik eigenlijk wel vrolijker van, van dan een Airbnb. Ja. Dus, uh, nee, ik heb er veel zin in. En, um, um, en hoe ga je retreat? Komt dat uh, een beetje van de grond? Nou, genuanceerd. Dus ik heb verschillende... Uh, bij individuen merk ik gewoon dat er veel bedenktijd nodig is. Ja. En ik heb nu nog maar één retreat. Dus ja, iemand moet als precies eind juni naar Portugal willen. Ja. De een zegt, ja, ik wil meer met dit, ik wil meer met dat. Dus dan ontstaat wel iets meer het idee, als ik stel dat ik nou een veel bredere offering heb, dan kan je mensen meer bedienen, dus dat is wel grappig. Maar ja. ik heb mijn tweede retreat eigenlijk verkocht aan Kula, dat is een ondernemerscommunity. Ja, die heb jij zelf opgezet, toch? Ja, die heb ik zelf opgezet, ja. ja. <laughs> Klaas. Heel goed, en, jongen. En die gaan het vullen, dus dat is eigenlijk een B2B-propositie. Ja. Ik had gisteren een gesprek met een dame die doet een retreat van een maand in september, een reset maand. En die heb ik nu ook op de site gezet en dan krijg ik commissie als ik iemand binnenbreng. Top. Dus ik heb nu B2C, B2B en dan het affiliate wel. Hatsa. 
En dan wil ik vanaf daar kijken. Plus er zijn wat mensen die links en rechts zeggen, hey, leuke dingen doe je, ik wil ook al een keer breathwork doen. Dus er is behoefte aan eigenlijk een instap iets. Er is een doel, die ken ik nog van een soort sportprogramma vijf jaar geleden. Die heeft bij de Brouw gewerkt en wel echt mooi, wel een mooie figuur, maar ook best wel conservatief. Nou, kon het traditionele doelt. Maar ik zei, ik vind het echt mooi wat je allemaal doet, maar ik ken het allemaal niet echt. Maar ik zou het wel echt leuk vinden om een keer iets te proberen. Ja. Dus ik zie zeg maar wel behoefte ontstaan. Dus jij zei, nou, gaan we een keer ayahuasca doen in Ecuador? <lacht> <lacht> Kom maar mee. <lacht> hmm. ah, eh, klopt. Ja. Ja. En um, ik, ik vind het ook ergens wel spannend. Want, ja, ga ik het... Ja, ik weet eigenlijk het antwoord al. Ik ga het, wel, ik ga het ook wel uitbouwen. Um, maar wat is echt mijn kern? Een visieretreat zes dagen vind ik echt mooi. Maar vind ik het ook mooi om iemand dan een intro to breath voor te geven. Dus, dus daar wil ik goed blijven checken. Wat vind ik echt mooi om te doen? Of waar zit ik dan al iedereen maar weer te helpen? Ja. Um, maar het antwoord is dus, het is, het is niet makkelijk hoor. Het is best wel een sensitive product, zeg maar. Ja. Ja, dat snap ik. Dat snap ik goed. Ja. Dat snap ik goed. En hoe is het met jouw uh, cliënt, met die 100 engineers? Um, ja, dat, dat, die kreeg ik al een mailtje. En die, 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 die echt de, een, de, de soort van hoop die ik ook maar een klein beetje had, die, die borde die vakkundig in de grond. Dat die zei, mm. ja, we hebben echt niemand nodig en dat gaat allemaal prima. Terwijl mm. degene die met hem werkt, die zei, we moeten 100 engineers, jullie moeten praten. Dit gaat gebeuren. Echt ongeveer ja. zo, zo werd ik geïntroduceerd. Maar ik ga hem wel straks even, even zien en, en ontmoeten om, uh, om half zes. Dus, uh, ah, dan zijn we iets meer dan een uur. Ik ga even de ventilator aanzetten. Ja, dat lijkt me een goed plan. Ja, jongen, ik ga je laten zweten, jongen. Even kijken. Oh, je lijkt het niet te doen. Nou, dat maakt niet uit. Even kijken, zijn er nog updates? Dus we hadden gezegd accountability. Ja. Dat verdient een serieuze aandacht. We hebben natuurlijk ja. gewoon uh, de live in New York, uh, je, je hele journey. Maar is er, nog, uh, is er nog een reflectie die je wilt delen voor als we beginnen? Um... Nee, volgens mij, volgens, mij, volgens, volgens, volgens mij, ik denk dat hij er zo wel gaat lopen, toch? Wat, ja. we vorige keer, wat we vorige keer besproken hadden. Ja, ja ik heb ja. allemaal weer allemaal leuke nieuwe mensen gesproken. En over personal branding en weet ik wat allemaal. Dus, ja. dus, we gaan het ja. wel aan de slag. Ja. Aan de slag. Het leuke is, ik wil mensen inspireren met een podcast. Maar om natuurlijk naar een next level te gaan. Maar het is ook leuk voor de, de gasten zoals jij. Dus hoe wil je geïntroduceerd worden? Dus is het misschien al leuk uh, entrepreneur, motivational speaker? Zeg maar dat even de future... Uh, dat, dat erbij zetten of is dat too much? Ja, doe maar. Waarom niet? Dat is wel leuk, toch? Ja, fake it till you make it. Ik ja. kan pot roeren. Hopsa. Accountability. Ja, oké. Okay, nou, ik ja. ga eens beginnen. Ja. Oké, okay, nou, we gaan, uh, we gaan beginnen. Wordt het opgenomen trouwens qua recording ook of niet? Ja, het wordt ook opgenomen, maar tot nu toe publiceer ik het nog niet. Maar dat kunnen we wel doen als we dat willen. Oké, okay, top. Mensen zeggen dat ik daar iets mee moet doen, maar ik heb er nog niet zo goed over nagedacht. Ik zie dat echt elke podcast als doen namelijk. Zowel YouTube als podcast. Ja, hè? Ja. ja. Oké. Okay. Hello, friends. Welcome back to the Soul Kitchen. To a new uh, episode. I'm very excited to meet Adrian Kolf today. He is a fellow man from the Netherlands that I met for the first time in Burning Man. I think it was in 2017. And... Um, He is a wearer of many hats because he is a motivational speaker, sharing his wisdom often on LinkedIn, for instance. He is known for using public accountability tools to make himself accountable for his results. He uh, has been to, uh, to Burning Man, as I mentioned earlier. He lives in New York and also has his own, um, own business. Um, Adrian, how are you doing today? Hey Jasper, yeah, no, great, uh, great to be here and excited for, uh, for for this conversation. And and who would have thought, right? Many years ago, when we ran into each other at Burning Man, that now many years later, you would be living in Costa Rica, I'm living in New York, and uh, and we're uh, we're having a podcast on the Soul Kitchen. I definitely uh, didn't think about it uh, when we met at Burning Man, but sometimes when you meet each other at an event, even if it's one or two or three evenings, it can be this uh, memorable experience. So. When you look back at that specific Burning Man, like what, how was it for you? I mean, it, to be honest, first time I, I went to Burning Man, so 
I, my first Burning Man was in 2016, and every year I've been going to Burning Man ever, ever, ever since. Um, first time, I honestly had no idea what we really said yes to. I went with my four closest friends, um, and it just blew my mind. The creativity, the parties, the DJs, the people that I met, just the scale and the size of it. Um, and it's hard to, to describe magic, but the true magic of, of uh, radical inclusion that I felt there is something that I've never experienced anywhere else in the world and was for me the reason to come back. So the year after I, I ran into you and I ran into who is now my wife um, at Burning Man as well. And that's the reason why I'm actually living in New York because uh, my wife, she's been living close to 30 years in New York. Uh, and two years ago, I decided to move to New York and uh, we're now uh, we're now married. Wow. So you met your wife at uh, at Burning Man and I can imagine an extra special event for you. Definitely. So every year we have a little celebration when we go back and we already booked everything for this year to uh, to go again. When is this year? It's it's always last week of August, the uh, first week, uh, first week of September. Ah. And um, I can imagine that uh, Burning Man has been uh, special for you, but to what extent do you bring Burning Man into, let's say, your regular life or your work? Or is it more, let's say, one off week that, that stays there? Ah. Uh. So, yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I I think a little bit of both, right? Like let's let's not like overdo it in terms of life changing and I, <laughs> I you know like I, I implement all these things, but I think so burning is based on 10 principles and, and a couple of principles are are I think you could use really in, in, in everyday life. And and one of them is radical inclusion, accept everyone however they show up in whatever shape or form, and a burning man that can go to the extreme, right? Like you have people that for whatever reason, like to walk naked the entire day. You have people that want to dress up. You have people that um, that really let their own kind of like self out whatever they they are like maybe hiding in 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 uh, in, in the real world, and um, and it's extremely liberating because you can be your true self without judgment, right? And that is extremely liberating. But it's also something that you actually need to learn the first time when you come to Burning Man is to not judge because. You're so kind of like still wired of like what is normal according to your own perceptions. So when you get there in the beginning, when you see a group of naked guys cycling around, you're like, oh, what the fuck, guys? Like, I <laughs> like, really? Like, is that necessary? But you realize, like, why not? Right. Like, and that makes it special that actually they feel comfortable enough to do that. And like, you know, that's their way of like that they want to experience it. Right. Yeah. And some other people like to like to dress up extremely sexy and really like let their sexy goddess out, right? What, what, whatever, whatever that is for you. Yeah, it, it's funny how you can have certain uh, uh, perceptions that at the beginning you think it's weird behavior, but for, for instance, about nakedness, we're also born naked, uh, but we're not used to it anymore. But I remember at Burning Man that there was a transformation part where you enter like this space, and then everyone is naked, and then you go go into a foam. Uh, First, you go clubbing with each other, then you go into a foam, uh, I don't know, foam show, and then you come out transformed. And I think the intention is also that people can move through body shame and these types of things. But it indeed, it stretches your thinking. It's kind of liberating. Yeah. But can you give maybe one example from your own life where you've shown yourself or the liberated version of yourself? Cool. Um... Yeah, where 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 did that show up? So I think I think one of the things is that I've learned over time is the more vulnerable you show up about what's happening truly in your life, whether that's personal or whether that's business, um, the more vulnerable other people open up to you. And and it's something I, I try to practice uh, running my own company is so one of the examples uh, is is I'm, I'm doing one to ones with with my employees, and one thing that's that's currently a very big topic in my personal life is is the fact that um, I'm most likely not going to be a father. Um, oh yeah, my wife she's uh, she's she's 42, turning 43 this year. So it will be very hard for us to conceive naturally. We've gone through two IVF um, and processes, didn't work out. We have three miscarriages, right? So all of a sudden I'm slowly like trying to like get used to the idea that I'm most likely not going to be a father. And the reason why I'm expressing this here today on, on the podcast, which is a very personal topic is what I found is one by sharing it, I often open up other people that have gone through similar experiences and, and two, 
it really helps to like connect with people that on a, on a vulnerable and like personal level and 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 it it really opens up other people as well to like go deep and like share what's really happening versus something that i think i was more doing on a more superficial way it's like hey how are you yeah great it's pretty cool out today right like yeah you know and like before you know you're kind of like in this realm yeah. of like not really connecting with anyone um so yeah so that's 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 something uh, i think uh, i think is, is something i uh, yeah try to practice yeah, or not so try to practice but like that comes right yeah indeed so it's showing uh, vulnerability and also recognizing uh, that it is a strength and, and and what does it do for you uh, that you maybe don't become a um, uh, father how how is that for you at the moment uh yeah hard very hard and it's it's not something there's there's not really like a solution for it right like it, it really is something that's I've always pictured myself as a dad. I've always like had this vision of like raising kids and like seeing some part of you like being translated to uh, to something as as dear as as, as your own uh, daughter or son. And the thought of of not having that is 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 hard, and it just takes time. And luckily, my wife and I were were, were good communicators about this this stuff. Um, where she already has a daughter like my stepdaughter right but that's that's so for her that that missing or that long is is less but for me uh, that's that's a big uh, a big part of my life but that's that's really what's uh, in my happening in my personal life right now yeah yeah thank you for sharing that uh, uh, so vulnerably and uh, what i've noticed sometimes in your life when things happen uh, suddenly you connect with other people that have similar experiences or maybe you pay more attention to it is that now the case with you as well? So you connect with other men that have similar challenge? Um, so so definitely I'm I'm to be honest, I'm 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 not so vocal about this, right? It's not like no. hey, you know, <laughs> hey, let's meet Adrian and let's immediately like I I I I pour my heart out, but it's kind of like I don't know, like we've we've always had this this special connection that I feel that we really go deep, uh, Jasper. So hence sends me uh, yeah, addressing this uh, this this came to mind. Um but what I noticed when we um had our first miscarriage is we told people quite early on it's like hey we is pregnant we were excited about it um and then she had a miscarriage right so then we kind of like had to tell people it's like hey we lost the lost the baby and only then it turned out that even like some of my closest friends had experienced the, a miscarriage that i that i was never aware of right like they were like oh we had this as well or or you heard stories about people that had really difficulty in terms of conceiving um and I was almost like surprised, like, oh, I didn't know that, right? Like, and it's it's such an impactful thing, but sometimes like people like want to keep that to themselves. But yeah, we're we're all humans. We all go through this stuff, right? We can learn from each other and uh, we can support each other in the, in that sense. Yeah, no, that's uh, that is absolutely true. So thank you for sharing that um, uh, so vulnerably. Do you have experience uh, in Costa Rica? There's like some some people that are active in man circles. Is that something that you've ever been part of? Is it not your cup of tea? Yeah, yeah, no, that's definitely something. I'm actually, I'm, 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 I'm a seeker of that, and that that is also like has helped me uh, to to open up. And so I'm part of multiple groups, uh, including including a men's group, where we have a have a format whereby it basically falls to every uh, every men format, which is a pretty well known uh, men's group kind of like circle format, whereby we do a check in. We think at the moment, um, everyone shares what's really happening in terms of their 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 personal or business life, whatever whatever that might be, um, and then as a group, we kind of like defines like oh like so what is the challenge or like so that someone's dealing with that we want to go a little bit deeper in, mm -hmm. and and then someone ex and and what happens is that so for example this will be a pretty big topic right like everyone's like whoa you know like that's a big topic Adrian can you address a little bit more like what's happening right so then. I explain in more detail uh, why this 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 problem is there, this challenge, and then everyone speaks from their own personal experience or advice. That's always like a kind of like little 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 gray area of hey, you know, when I went through something similar like this, this is what worked for me, or when I had difficulty in my relationship, you know, this is kind of like the reset that we did, or when my company almost went bankrupt, this is kind of like the things that we've done, right? Mm -hmm. And having such different perspective and like showing up and, and and not like being always like the strong man and you got to know everything and kind of like the the image the image that we have is one extremely liberating 
but that's where the growth lies, right? Like, like it's it's always to me so surprising that things that I think are very unique or or um, yeah, very situational for me personally. I don't think I've ever had like with any of the shares that someone couldn't relate or like had a similar experience or had gone through something almost almost exactly the same. Mm, yeah, it's uh, sometimes very powerful when you can uh, share a challenge and then other other people can also share their uh, their challenges and uh, and learn from it. And um, thing about sharing, one of the things that I like about you is that you share your goals uh, publicly. So yeah. I've been following you uh, on LinkedIn and I don't read, uh, let's say every post, but I've, I've been following your journey a little bit. And I think it is inspiring because you put your, uh, in, in the Dutch, they say you, uh, you, you left your ball op het hakblok. You put your, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is in English. Try that one. Try that one. Jasper. <laughs> <laughs> you put your, yeah. I don't know, everything you have like publicly. Yeah um and it does inspire me to really uh, reflect on my goals and i am someone that is also quite conscious about goal setting but i've never shared them publicly so sometimes i get away with maybe finishing 70 percent my goals but you really have to think about it 100 because you share publicly so why did you start doing this and what has it brought to you so far so kind of like the backdrop of that, and it's it's a little bit of a of, of an introduction in terms of the journey that 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 I've been on. So so I started my career at, at Unilever, four years at Unilever, first finance and marketing. But after kind of like four years, I realized like that the big corporate world, it wasn't really my cup of tea. Um, and I wanted to do something more entrepreneurial. And um, wasn't coming from like an entrepreneurial family or wasn't really in an entrepreneurial environment. So I was like kind of like looking from like how, how, like what is my idea? And then I got a chance to become partner at a small digital recruitment platform um, in Amsterdam, um, and they decide to go for it. And what I thought was going to be like infinite freedom, I can build, I can do all this stuff, was actually um, much harder than I anticipated. And, and reflecting back, what I really struggled with was structure and someone telling me what to do. Because at Unilever, I also had a boss, and a boss, and a boss, and a boss. You know, the, the, the ladder was endless. In the end, giving the framework and kind of like, this is what I expected from you in this role. At the end of the year, you need to have done X, Y, Z and, you know, like go for it. And you would always have every week had, had someone to bounce off ideas. Being partner at this company, I, I had my two co-founders, right? But it's a very different dynamic. They weren't telling me what to do. They were like, this is where we want to go. Let's, let's just go for it, right? So over the course of those, those first couple of years, I really struggled with, with structure and process and like setting my own discipline because also that doesn't come naturally for me, right? Like I'm borderline, <laughs> I'm borderline ADHD. I love every shiny aspect, right? Like if, if people talk here, like I'm out, right? Like, like, and I love to do all these other things, right? But so, yeah. so keeping focused and like being, being like near zero, zero down and like keeping my own discipline is really, really hard for me. Um, so kind of like fast forward to to where 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 we are now um is i i went to seminars i read tons of books on this right like it, because it, i i really saw that it was becoming uh, becoming a uh, an issue or, or like a challenge for uh, for me is um i i came across a, a company called commit action and literally their business model is for entrepreneurs like me mm -hmm. is to have an accountability coach because it turns out that if you have an accountability coach and what you mean with an accountability coach that literally checks in with you on a weekly basis adrian jasper or whoever whatever your name is did you do the things that you were supposed to do mm -hmm. because we're great at making lists. i'm great at making lists but i'm also great at hijacking those lists like i know kind of like what i need to do but like <laughs> i'll do it tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, and tomorrow right and um, but what the accountability coach does, it's it's the simplest thing ever. It's like it puts a deadline on the things that you have to do. And if you don't do it, he confronts you with yourself. So what happened, I started to work with this accountability coach. And all of a sudden, my productivity started to go. Because I knew mm -hmm. in the first weeks, like I hijacked myself again. So I I, I would set my goals that this is the stuff that I'm going to be doing. Um, and I would go on with my week. And then... The next week, I would do a check in with my coach again. I was like, oh, fuck. Didn't do the things. I was like, yeah, but X or that no. or that, right? <laughs> and my coach was like, but this is 
Adrian, do you see what's happening, right? So he really mirrored my own behavior. And over time, I started to build the grid and like I put the things in my agenda, really. Um, and, and I was able to get much more done uh, over time. And that's when I realized the power of accountability and actually sharing your goals, because that's that's where the magic is, right? By actually sharing, committing to your goals, you have other people hold you accountable. And to your point, you start up the conversations like, well, you inspire me because like, I, I'm also like conscious about goal setting, but I only do 70%. But because yeah. you do it, because, because you do it publicly, you have to do it, right? Yeah. And that's, that's, it's weird psychology, right? That's how it works, but it only works, that's my experience, because everyone puts New Year's resolutions on them whatsoever and then like forgets about them. And then at the end of the year, like, oh yeah, I, I wanted to like exercise more. I wanted to quit smoking. I wanted to like do all of these things. And, and the majority doesn't, doesn't do it, right? It is the weekly check-in that holds you and keeps you on track of, the, of, of that process. Very yeah. quick check-in. I now do it with, uh, with another entrepreneur. We hold each other accountable every week. So you don't have to pay for it. Like find someone that you respect and that, that wants to invest in, in that relationship and takes time. And that's kind of like on a similar path. Works like magic for both of us. Mm -hmm. I think it's a beautiful story. So if we go to the starting point, when you, uh, after Unilever, you uh, were kind of an entrepreneur uh, in some other company, but you were finding out that the structure and the discipline is a very difficult element. And yeah. then there's a, uh, your role becomes broader, right? Because in a corporate, you have a smaller defined role. Yeah, no, hundred percent, hundred percent. So you have a broader role, but what were the um, the 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 most relevant distractions that you were they, let's say, within the company, or was it, let's say, also outside the work, but in life as an entrepreneur, or was it already like within the company, like what could I do? No, it was it was it was mainly the company, right? Like my 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 social life didn't change that much because of the the step from 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 com from from kind of like Unilever to to uh, that first company, um, but um, it, it was really in the different hats that I was wearing and the different things that I thought I had to be doing, and also like the kind of like unknowns, like how do I do this, right? That that's that's really where this uh, this came yeah. to life. So it's really the prioritization, the the accountability. And you definitely are inspiring uh, others around goal setting. Uh, but I'm also curious, to what extent do you feel your own goals have been achieved more because you shared it publicly? That, uh, honestly, that's that that really is where the magic lies, right? Like, and, and I've done research, I've done books, like I, I really went uh, went a little scientific on this. So research has shown that, that, that you are about to reach your goals. There's a 70% more likelihood if you share your goal with someone else to actually reach uh, reach those goals, so for me writing them and I, I write them on my LinkedIn page at the beginning at the beginning of the year, right? That is an acknowledgement to myself, but also to the rest of the world. This is you guys are holding me accountable. This is what I want to achieve, and what I what what I do is like it's not only business, right? It's also personal. It's also I want to spend more. I want to have free family dinners with uh, with uh, with Serafim and my stepdaughter Anoya, right? I yeah. want to run an ultra marathon, right? So that's something I put on there. And and I make them concrete. I, they're, they're, they're ambitious, but like, if I really put all my time and effort on it, I can actually achieve them. And and true to be told, Jasper, I don't make all the goals, right? Like not everything happens uh, in that sense, but if I look in my last three years and the years before, my productivity has has honestly doubled or tripled compared to the, the years that I wasn't like working on this, uh, this method. Yeah. So it's very effective from a productivity point of view and from an entrepreneurial effectiveness, personal effectiveness. And then a little bit, the meta uh, question is, of course, to what extent uh, does it make you happier? And then there's this uh, guy, he wrote a book, I think it's called 4,000 Weeks or 8,000 Weeks. And he's a guy that was like a time management uh, guru. He read everything about time management. He wanted to be more productive, more productive, more productive, more productive. But at some point, he was a bit done with his own productivity. And then he started reviewing time again. And he thought, I want to be less productive because then I have kind of more time. Anyway, long story short, so to what extent does it make you happier or more satisfied or, yeah. And it's such a good question because it's it, it's exactly kind of like, one of the questions that I'm dealing with right now. So what has what it has brought me is, and, and that is something that I'm kind of like forever grateful for, is 
I've been able to like train my my muscle of uh, my, my brain muscle of something that doesn't come naturally to like be more disciplined in terms of the work in in, in whatever I kind of like do right so so that that is something that whatever kind of like uh, goal setting or or not goal setting I I'm doing for the rest of my life is is something that that really worked for me. Now third year in that I'm setting these very deliberate goals and like planning them for the first time I realized that they were giving me less energy than the the years before. Years before, I was like, "This is it," you know, like, and it almost felt like I'm doing this, you know, and 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 I'm 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 crushing uh, crushing these goals, which felt great at the end of the year as well. I was like, "You see, I've 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 done it. I've I've uh, made all these goals." But now, third year in, I realized like that the goals not necessarily have changed me that much, but they just are bigger in terms of the revenue I want to make or the distance I want to run or like whatever, well, whatever kind of like is is on there. Um, is you can get caught up in this hamster wheel, bigger, better, stronger, whatever that is, right? Like, and, mm -hmm. and, and it's a never ending race. <laughs> and, and there's an interesting study that's been done um, on, on midlife crisis, right? Is that, so what research has shown is that midlife crisis is people come to, to, to a point where they realize that they're old enough to realize that that the goals and everything that they've done are all these little candles that they've these milestones of these candles that they've blown out along the way and they're old enough to see the path that they've walked but also kind of like still young enough to see what's ahead of them and they realize it's just more candles right like where's that fulfillment coming in yeah. like what do i really want and that is kind of like the interesting um doing versus being right like mm -hmm. can i just be in the moment and in the presence versus yeah. chasing these candles constantly and to me i find it a very interesting balance to do both to not get caught up too much in the four thousand and eight thousand week cycle of goals <laughs> goals goals and there's nothing else that can happen and like the creativity is gone and like oh no with something unexpected happens i'm not gonna make my goal right because you're so caught up in that kind of like blowing out more candles um that is that it's an interesting balance. So I've actually I've gone a little less on my goals this year, giving myself a little bit more 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 breathe room as well on kind of like what comes what comes at play and see what that feels like now. Yeah, I see. So it brought you a lot in terms of uh, also managing maybe your own challenge with being disciplined and structured. It brought you to New York. You're an entrepreneur, but now you're maybe contemplating on the uh, doing versus the being and then my next question is can you also have goals at the being level or is that a goalless uh, thing that is such a funny thing because when when i had a discussion with uh, with with an entrepreneur group that i'm that i'm part of my first reaction was when we talked about this is like i need to meditate four times per week <laughs> and i'm like i'm like wait wait no it shouldn't be like that right like 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 i was immediately in that like i need to get this done i need to chuck 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 right and that's that really is a muscle that really is a muscle that you need to learn that's really a muscle that you need to play to be in a moment to be in the presence right to like kind of like let go and 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 and, and yeah practice that yeah so it's a practice indeed and um but I find challenging. So sometimes I find presence when I meditate. I've just been to the waterfall. So it makes me more excited for the podcast because I, I've been relaxing. So sometimes I can be in the present, but sometimes I'm working very productive and then I forget about it. But to what extent can you be in the present when you work and also as a leader? Because how many employees do you actually have in your company? We're, we're, we're close, uh, close to 40, uh, 40 employees. Yeah, so you have a, a big responsibility, uh, at least in my opinion. Um, so to what extent can you be present in your work and also with, with the people uh, that you lead or, or that you provide employment? So, so, and, and, and help me understand a little bit deeper on, on the question. What do you mean with the... Maybe for me, it's difficult when I'm working, I get like obsessed with all these tasks and then it's harder to be like really present. Yeah. Uh, but to what extent can you be present while you're working? So, so kind of like it's 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 almost like enforced because uh, I'm based in New York, but but uh, my employees are based in CT time zone. So my day starts basically at six o'clock until one. I'm back to back calls, right? Like mm -hmm. so, I, I just my agenda lives me. That's when I do all my calls. That's when I do all the catch up with, uh, with with everyone. And then theoretically, I have almost like a kind of like clean afternoon where I can actually do some of the work that I have to do. 
um, which is which is theoretically because often things I have a podcast right now. I like, like <laughs> things, 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 uh, things do 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 fill up uh, fill up on the on, on on the agenda. But yeah, it's it's for me it's a balancing act. And what I've noticed, like my biggest thing is if I if I am able to get into flow state, is cut out all the these are like obvious things, but cut out all the extractions. But for me, the biggest uh, kind of like productivity tool is is sleep. Yeah. If I want to get into that flow state, like if for me that has such a big effect, I I I have a tendency to sleep only like six seven hours, but if mm -hmm. I hit the eight hour, whoo, massive difference in terms of being able to sleep. I just this is maybe one of the hijacks that that I just do myself. I'm like almost ready to go to bed, and then always find a little distraction, do this, do that, and then then I I lose kind of like that hour. But that's that's for me the strongest the strongest uh, um, enabler to to get in that flow state and be present. Yeah. So, so sleeping is important, and uh, you're also a, a marathon runner, right, or an ultra runner? Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. Can and you tell me more about it and and the role it plays in your life? Yeah, so I've I've always loved running. So I get into flow state uh, quite quickly, but I've never like thought about like running ultra marathons or marathons until, um, in, I think 2014. I started to run a little bit more and I was like, hey, let's sign up for a race. And I think it was the race on the, on the, on the beach, the, the half marathon from, from Egmond. And, and I really discovered how, how much pleasure it gave me to have a race in the books and like kind of like train for it. And, and the funny thing is looking back at that moment of, of 20, 2040 when I did the, the, the half marathon on the beach of, of Egmond, to me that achievement at that time was the same kind of like dopamine rush and, and how proud I felt crossing the finish line and how good I felt about myself and training and leading up to that. As now last year, I finished a hundred kilometer race through the mountains, which took mm -hmm. me 12 and a half hours to complete, right? Um, and what I've learned over time and how, how it's really helped me is one, again, putting a race in the calendar. I know in six months time, no matter the distance, I need to show up and it's my own responsibility how I'm going to enjoy that race. If I don't train, it's going to be terrible. Going to, I might not make it right. It's going to be miserable. But if I put in the hours and the work now, the discipline of getting up, even when I'm tired, when it's raining, when it's cold, when it's snowing, in order to show up at that finish, I have no one else to blame or to be proud of at the start of that race. Um, and that, that's something that is uh, not only physically, you know, you, you get into shape, but also like mentally. It's such a strong muscle to play to like get that discipline in get the rhythm in of like going a little bit further and and, and pushing yourself and, and really seeing what you are truly capable of because the ultra marathon like three years ago if you would have asked me it's like would you ever run like a hundred kilometer race i would have honestly told you Jasper, you're insane like what one why would i want to do that two hundred kilometers running like that that's that distance is insane right but it took me a full marathon. It took me an Ironman. I've done a full Ironman, right? Like that's that's when I realized, whoa, this endurance stuff. I I, I like it. That's that that's cool. But then like kind of like uh, stop 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 doing the endurance. But then I did a. I was like, I wanted to change, but I did a 50k uh, run. Mm -hmm. And when I finished that one, I was like, can I do 100k? And now that I've wow. done 100, now that I've done 100k, what I came to realize is that it's all perspective, mm -hmm. because I now know because I've done it, right? I now yep. know that every single person on this planet is capable of running 100K. It doesn't matter like the time or the pace or whatsoever, because it's your mindset that blocks you and that stops you of putting the working and the training and like saying, that's crazy, I could never do that. No, that's that's your, that's honestly is your mindset. If you think you can and you start to train and put the hours in, you will succeed. Yeah. So your mindset really influences your, your results and you can take it one step. Um further all the time and at the soul kitchen i always ask people what their recipe for life is because listeners get the recipe from each guest and is your recipe related to goal setting and accountability or or do you have a different recipe or what is your recipe for life what's my recipe for life so so um <laughs> i need to think of think about that for the spot because a couple things come 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 to life and this might sound a little bit cheesy but now reflecting on the last couple of years and in and, and the different countries that I've lived in, businesses that I started that, that seemed impossible, Burning Man is a, is a, is a big, uh, big inspiration there as well, coming back like full circle to the start of our conversation, is 
anything is really possible if you put your mindset to it. Anything. Honestly, anything. <laughs> Honestly, Jasper, like, look, look, look at us, right? We're now having a conversation. You're living in Costa Rica. You set up Soul Kitchen. You just had an idea. Let's start a podcast. Never done it. And and now you're interviewing me. I'm like, what am I doing here on this on, on this <laughs> podcast, right? Like, but yeah. but 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 it's yeah. not something that I plan to do. But like, it really is. If if you really put your mind to it, you can truly truly make make magic happen. Um. And then the analogy of the ultra ultra marathon running, right? Is I now know that you can, right? Like I I know that this is possible. So yeah. if I put my mind to it, what else is possible, right? Like so that that will be my uh, that will be my little sprinkle of, uh, of 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 life. I like that anything is uh, is possible. So your limitation is is only where you think your limitation is, and I think you're a good example. I mean. You were the president of your uh, uh, student union or student fraternity, yeah. And uh, now you're an entrepreneur in New York, which is very hard uh, to reach. I mean, getting a job in New York is not easy, but surviving as an entrepreneur is is hard. Um, where does it come from that drive? Did you always have that, or at some point in your life you you read you read a book or you met a mentor, or does it come from your parents, or where does it come from? Yeah, it's a good question. So I always w had like super high energy, right? Like super high energy. I was very enthusiastic about everything. It, it, it's one of my super strengths, but also like something that that has definitely not always helped me. Again, focus and structure is is, is hard. I would take hours for homework, for example. Was always distracted and and everything like uh, like that. And um, but that drive to like constantly go and like push myself has always like been this burning fire inside of me. And I think. The, the pivotal moment was was for me is when I just got a chance to become an entrepreneur in a relatively safe environment of a company that already existed, where I kind of like learned about entrepreneurship, so to say, um, and that's that's been that's been an absolute game changer for me because I saw from my co-founders at that time they had an ID that went for it. Where with mm -hmm. Unilever, I had to make a slide, and then my boss corrected my slide, and that guy corrected the slide, and in the end, I didn't even recognize any of the work that I've done because everyone was changing slides and everyone was putting things in motion. And I understand now because how big the company is and all the implications, etc. But from them, like usually a meeting would like be half done, and then we've already been like reaching out to people of IDs that we had, and that's yeah. that's really where I learned like okay, ID, it's all about action, right? It's all yeah. about taking action and 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 pushing things forward. It is true. That's also what I like about uh, entrepreneurship, or let's say the, the the free path that you, when you have an idea, you can execute on it. So I really like that recipe for life. That anything is uh, is possible, and you have reached uh, the state where you're an entrepreneur in uh, in in New York. And uh, of course, New York has pros and cons, but let's focus on the the pros um, uh, for this moment. But I've think will be cool when you live there is that you meet so many like inspiring uh, uh people that are kind of close to you but how how is that for you like the people you're surrounded by the people that you meet no and it, it's that's i think that's why new york is such a hard city to leave because of the people it's such a high concentration of people from every single walk of life from every country in the world and um, and that creates an incredible dynamic of of diversity age doesn't play different we have we have friends that are in their 80s and uh, we have super young friends all different races it doesn't really matter and um, and that brings a lot of new process uh, new ideas a lot of new um uh perspectives on on on, on life and, and a very interesting dynamic uh, which which i love and, and that truly inspires and that energy is absolutely contagious because also new york is a city that is hard, right? There's no like if you don't make it, there's no one here for you. You know, like it's a very anonymous city at the same time mm -hmm. as well. Like that's a downside. But everyone's in that kind of like same. Everyone's drawn to that same kind of like level of energy that that people want to want to go. People are ambitious. People are hungry, um, and you get inspired by all these other people that are building businesses, that are writing a book, that are actors that are singers that are acrobats mm -hmm. that are painters that that live from two dollars on 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 on, the, on on a daily monthly budget because they are inspired to be a sculptor right they meet these fascinating 
weirdos from all over the place, right? Like, and, and that is that is so refreshing and sometimes also intimidating, especially in the beginning when I came here, it was very intimidating for me because nobody gave a shit that I was from the Netherlands and I had like a recruitment company in Ukraine. It's like, all right, like there are 20 other people here from Ukraine or from the Netherlands or whatsoever. Like what's what's going on with you, right? So I really had to like, um, I, I like, really like work on myself in terms of okay who am i like what do i have to offer for a conversation right when wh wherever the conversation was uh was was, yeah. was going um and that that i i love that and that's so the fact, loop the fact that great. you were the, the president of a student society in uh, groningen didn't blew that didn't blow them away oh my goodness nobody <laughs> gave a shit nobody gave a shit nobody gave a shit because everyone else is like from somewhere cooler than than in a, in, in 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 the world right I met an I met a, a circus artist from Mongolia, right? Like that that fled with her parents uh, to to the to the U.S. and and uh, her parents like had a donut shop, and then yeah. she she discovered herself as an acrobat. Like holy shit, what a story, right? Yeah. It's like oh yeah, I'm this uh, Dutch guy, and I used to be president of my fraternity. It's like what? It's like, <laughs> 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 and it's not like that's and but but the good thing is, and that's something that I learned over time, is right, is is because of that I was really intimidated in the beginning. It's like holy yeah. shit, everyone everyone else has like this cool stuff going on, but yeah. that's 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 if you get over that, you realize no, everyone's dealing with the same shit. Everyone's like wants to still be loved. Everyone wants to make friends. Everyone is, is is in that same kind of like 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 both. And if you're able to connect on that, if you're able to share vulnerably like what's really going on, yeah. that's that's in the end where the magic lies. I think it can imagine it's a it's a humbling experience. I spent one year in London and I for me it was also a little bit humbling because no one really cared about who I was. But sometimes community is is uh, important. So is the Burning Man community the was it important for you for your entrance in New York, or did you have other communities, or how how did it go for you? Yeah, so so of course I I, I my wife has been here for many years, right? So wow. I, I I didn't have to start from scratch. Even though my wife she's a documentary filmmaker, her friends were kind of like more on the uh, artsy artsy side of things, which is not necessarily the crowd that I usually uh, usually hang uh, hang with. But that was a really kind of like easy way into New York, right? But but still the beginning beginning was pretty hard because I, I was craving and missing my my close group of friends and family that i um that i knew so well from the netherlands and like felt so comfortable with like had such a good time with all the time and now i had to kind of like start from scratch and it definitely took time before i was able to like find my kind of like crew but that's that's also like i guess where the growth lies right and and, and finding and, and getting out of your comfort zone and uh, and, and meeting uh, meeting new people yeah no it is uh it is like that and and uh, yeah one by one you can feel more at home and um what is kind of the disadvantage of um of living in new york because in costa rica i meet a lot of people that maybe have been there but they maybe uh, left at some point because it's quite busy so how is how is that for you i mean yeah that that's that's where you say it right it's it's a highly concentrated city uh, where uh, where there's not much nature so that's that's a big downside and i i truly miss that and it's just a very expensive city right like what you what you pay here for an apartment and for rent it's uh, it's outrageous in yeah. order to be able to live here and you need to earn a lot of money in order to have like a comfortable uh, lifestyle here that yeah. that in costa rica you could you could be a freaking king with uh, with the amount of money <laughs> yeah. that you pay here on um, i just had a, a, a coffee latte uh, with oat milk for eight dollars right like <laughs> 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 and it's a small one that's a small that's a small cup of coffee yeah <laughs> No, no, it's true. So you need to make a lot of money, but yeah, it can indeed be really fun uh, to be part of such energetic uh, culture. I don't want to talk too much about the dark sides of New York. I'm more uh, more inspired by what what it issue. Um, I'm going to copy uh, Tim Ferriss a bit because this podcast yeah. sometimes asks people, you know, their favorite books, and I've also seen you sharing stuff on LinkedIn around books. Uh, so can you maybe share a few? And yeah. then also maybe explain the list for why they could read it, should read it, or what what in it for them. Yeah, I I, I didn't come prepared for, for for this question, but but I I love to uh, to read. Um, best book that I've read in a long time, nonfiction, is Chip War. Okay, it just got nominated a Financial Times Book of the Year for last year. Um, I, I probably finished it in three days. It's one of those books that I that I kept reading and even was reading on the toilet. Right, like that's kind of like how hooked you uh, hooked you are. And what the book does, it's it explains in a very pleasant, detailed but understandable way of 
um, the intricacies that are happening in the semiconductor industry and the tension that China has over Taiwan with the US and why Taiwan is an absolute linchpin in the whole semiconductor slash chip, uh, chip industry. And also kind of like proud being Dutch, uh, the, 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 the role that ASML plays of, of actually uh, producing these high quality chips and how completely dependent the entire world is on chips and how chips have become not only an economic, but also political uh, weapon that uh, especially the US is now really rallying in, in, in terms of uh, trying to get, uh, get get hold of the overall supply chain and trying to um, block China from accessing their, their high quality chips. Highly recommend it. It reads like fiction. It feels like it almost like James Bond story, but only to, to realize this is happening right in front of our eyes and, and where mm -hmm. the world is going. So that's chip war. Mm -hmm. Second book, fiction. So uh, three years ago, I started asking people around me, it's like, what is the best book uh, that you would recommend me and why? Um, and it was such a great question because all of a sudden I didn't have to do the research anymore because people typically have like one or two favorite books that they can, can easily recommend. Um, and this book was recommended by Gijs Groeneveld, the, 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 the founder of Peak4, uh, a cultural and leadership transformation uh, company. And he said, eight life. And eight life is, um, it's a very thick book, which I typically don't like to start because it looks intimidating. Um, but it's it's a story about a Georgian family that lives in Georgia, Eastern, Eastern Europe. Um, and it basically tells the fictional story of them, uh, four generations that go through uh, the communist period and what happens within the family um, of people that join the, the, the communist party, people that don't, the intricacies, the, 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 the dangers, the people that, uh, that, that are affected by everything that's happening. And it, it, it just slowly but steadily just sucks you in into this entire world until mm -hmm. you're living and breathing everything that's happening. And when, you close, uh, when I closed the last page, I honestly had tears in my eyes of how well this book was written, but the impact that it also had on, the, had on me and understanding what it was like, even though it was fiction, but understanding what it was like to live through those, uh, through those decades. Wow, that's, uh, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing uh, this wisdom. And uh, when do you find the time to, to read those books? Because uh, you do <laughs> it in the weekend. So, so two hacks I've learned. And I actually, the first hack, which is the biggest hack that I learned from my wife, audiobooks. Okay. And I listen to audiobooks when I run, and especially when I need to train, when I'm training for an ultra marathon, I put significant hours uh, into into my week. <laughs> Audiobook, <laughs> running, kind of like optimizing optimizing time. And um, I try to read five to 10 minutes. That's usually when I pass out. I'm a great sleeper, I see bed, I'm out. But um, I really like to read a couple pages before, uh, before I uh, go to bed. Mm -hmm. um, on my uh, on my uh, e-reader mm. and, and depending so, on the book so so honestly chip war i read for an hour before going to bed yeah. like, it was even like 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 so, devouring so, the pages but uh, but yeah you you combine kind of exercising and uh, and, and and reading so in that sense it's yeah. a bit of a, a bit of a time hack yeah that's really cool and as part of you living in new york i think you mentioned at some point that you like to invite people in the weekends or you and your wife have a bit of a philosophy of bringing people together is that still happening or can you share a bit about it yeah it's still happening i mean um so a couple of years ago um so, so we live on a very particular place in new york um we live basically on the high line the high line is a park it's an old uh, train track that that is on the kind of like the the, the level of the third floor that mm -hmm. runs uh, through chelsea um, and people walk on that on, on, on over that park, over that, that that old train track that they converted to a park. And it's exactly on the same level as our living room. So they, they look into our living room. And four years ago, my uh, my wife always she transformed our living room into an art gallery. So she displayed digital art uh, for, for the people on the hide line, giving artists a platform um, to showcase their digital art. This was all before NFTs or whatsoever. And for people on the high line to kind of like enjoy cool art. And then over time, it's kind of like transformed in terms of a place where we realize, hey, we can create any type of type of atmosphere in, inside of our living room um, to actually invite artists to perform and have like either kind of like a small musical concert or a sound meditation or a mushroom journey or a tango concert or a theater play or a movie screening. Um, and we can really like mix, mix, mix things up. And the beauty of it is, is 
because we we don't charge anything we just like to be involved we we like to be present we've met so many amazing people because of that uh, that showed up unexpectedly and, uh, and and some of them have have become uh, become dear friends because of it mm, i think I, that's really uh, uh beautiful because that's what i like when i'm abroad or maybe at burning man or certain places that like you mix people but when you're maybe in the netherlands there's a risk that this kind of doesn't happen. That's why I also left the Netherlands because I like more that that variety of people. But is it something that you also did when you were living in the Netherlands, or you kind of picked it up uh, while living in New York? It, it, honestly, it was my my wife driving it. Uh, so <laughs> so I, I was I was on the back seat. And I was like, hey, this is fun. Let's uh, let, let's do let's let's do more of it, right? And yeah. no, in in the Netherlands, I, I did like to organize things, but it was typically with the same group of friends that okay. I felt very comfortable with, and we we. Right, that's that's a downside a little bit of New York because it's a transit city as well. People move, right? To like the deep rooted roots that I that I felt with with some of the friends that I met during college or even 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 before that or in childhood, right? It's the same kind of stories, but you know each other so well. You can have like so much fun. It's very light, right? It's 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 um is is something that that was happening in the Netherlands, and therefore that kind of like didn't really change. But yeah. in all honesty, like without judgment or whatsoever. That's also not really where the growth lies, right? In terms of meeting new people and having having different different uh, perspective. Yeah, no, you can really grow by by yeah meeting new types of people and indeed uh, learning from their uh, their perspective. I um, I'm also curious to your perspective on uh, money because uh, as an entrepreneur, you know, you you make money, you spend money. It's constantly part of your life because you have to think about it uh, carefully. Yeah. You, know, you have to take calculated risks, uh, but you also invest money in uh, to go to certain masterminds and certain seminars. I think we talked about it earlier time. Yeah. And you also mentioned that you have a little bit of a new investment philosophy in those types of things. So can you share a bit more about your philosophy on uh, on money? Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a broad topic. So so first, let, let's start with like, I have this very weird relationship with money. I'm, I'm, it's, I'm, and I don't know if you recognize this, but I can honestly, decide not to put an avocado on my salad because i feel like oh i don't want to spend three dollars on, on this avocado on the salad is already expensive and then the day after i can say oh yeah come let's go to like a nice restaurant then i pay especially in new york right three hundred dollars on a meal for two yeah and it's the same kind of dollars right like so i i i have this kind of like weird kind of sense and i i go through abundance and scarcity right like that's mm -hmm. kind of like where where i'm at um on days where the company's going great like i feel like okay we can afford more sometimes like it's it's not but it really is this emotional attachment to 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 money that also like affects my mood and it's something i'm trying to like deal with to like not get us get get us affected by by kind of like the, the success of the business in terms of how i feel financially which uh, which which is which is uh, not always easy um but but over time is and this comes and this is why if i can say maybe this is also my, my recipe a little bit of life if, if i can say one thing is what i've learned over time of, of of by being connected with other entrepreneurs and actually talking about these things it is so amazing to get different perspectives because how i typically look at spending money on certain things is I looked at it from a cost perspective. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example. Four years ago, Oya, yeah, my wife, she said, I bought us tickets for Tony Robbins. Mm -hmm. Tony Robbins ticket was $4,000 per person, four days uh, in the event in Amsterdam. I wasn't making any money with my, with my, uh, with my company. I was like, holy shit, $4,000 for a conference of Tony Robbins, this, this weird American guy, right? Like I've heard of him, big seminars and stuff. And I heard people that kind of liked it, but I was like, I really felt uncomfortable spending that amount of money. What happened though is, is what Tony really talks about again is, is he really taught me, it's like think of, of my tennis old psychology, is the $4,000 that I spent there and the people that I met there, I got two clients from that conference, but also I realized is that I was looking at money in, in, in the wrong asset, right? I was looking at, I'm gonna spend $4,000 that I need to hold on to versus mm. the multiplier that that four thousand dollars gave me of expanding my knowledge of meeting other other people there i eventually got a got a client from it and i, I have another another uh, example like that um i'm part of this entrepreneur group here here in the us and um, very successful entrepreneurs many of them uh, much larger business than uh, than i do um and it was a four-day trip and and we were staying in the four seasons in costa rica 
Mm -hmm. super expensive per night. I would never, ever spend any, 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 anything close to that amount of money. And I felt un very uncomfortable actually spending that amount of money. But I remember the lesson that I learned during, during kind of like Tony Robbins seminar is that those four days gave me the opportunity to spend four days with very successful entrepreneurs that built different kind of kind of businesses that I looked up to both how they were living their life and, and how they were running their businesses. And I could get to spend like quality time with them, have breakfast, have lunch, do fun stuff together, right? Mm -hmm. And the money I spent there, I met a World Series of Poker player. I met a Michelin star chef. I met a world famous author uh, of, 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 of one of the most um, uh, best sold, sold, sold books in the world. I met a guy mm -hmm. that runs a private jet company. All of these very interesting guys that were dealing with their own kind of stuff. And they all turn out to have the same kind of challenges, maybe at a little bit of, a, of a, as a bigger scale than I did. They gave me tons of advice. And again, I ended up with, and I wasn't seeking that, but I ended up with a guy's like, oh, you got, you, you're in recruitment. Hey, maybe you can help me with X, Y, Z. And literally today we closed a deal with him. Um, and that has completely paid off for the entire trip. But even yeah. if that deal hadn't landed, just the perspective of being there and, 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 spending that amount of money will bring you so far and will bring you much further in terms of spending that yep. money on yourself right so that that's i think that's that's where where the real magic lies so it's really changing from like okay this is a cost that i'm making to like this is an investing investment that can multiply and is yeah. it tony robbins that explained to you how this works or you figured it out yourself when was kind no. of the aha moment it's so it, it is something that grew over time, but Tony Robbins and that really resonated with me. And it's something I, 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 I sometimes say to myself is power is proximity. Mm -hmm. And what he means with that is that if you surround yourself with a group of five entrepreneurs, you're going to be number six. If you surround yourself with four other millionaires, you're going to be number five. If you surround yourself with endurance athletes, you're going to be an endurance athlete, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you are your surrounding. So power is proximity. So it's your role if you want to grow, if you want to go further in life, to quickly climb that ladder. And climb the ladder, what I mean is like surround yourself with people that are doing the same kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to be a good investor, surround yourself with other investors that are thinking the same, sharing ideas, right? Because that's where the growth lies. But the other side happens as well, right? So DNA is a better prediction. Uh, sorry, uh, your zip code is a better prediction than DNA. Mm -hmm. So if you see, um, if you surround yourself, if your family, if everyone's overweight, you're most likely going to be overweight too, because yeah. healthy food is apparently not like something that's important in your family. So you're going to eat McDonald's and sip Coca-Cola all night long, and it's fine, right? If no one exercises in your surrounding, you're most likely not going to exercise either, right? Sure. If if everyone around you watches all these Netflix series, you're like, fuck it, I want to talk with these guys as well. I'm going to watch these Netflix series as well. And that is that is that is such a powerful thing to like realize and think of, of how and where do I spend my time and what money am I willing to spend in order to like be like be in whatever kind of environment, yeah. right? So power, power is proximity, and you have to surround yourself by people that you feel inspired by or that you can learn from. Yeah. But how do you make investment decisions? So there's many seminars, many things that you can do. Uh, do you make it based on intuition? Do you kind of calculate who you can meet there? How how do you actually make the decision? It's it's a little bit of both, right? It, it's a little bit of both. So so in, in this Costa Rica trip, I was like weighing pros and cons, but then again, four days, quality time. I, I knew the group of people. I was like, this there, there, there is a likelihood that I might do some business there, that's a calculated risk. And, and it's such an amazing experience. It's gonna be so, so I, I, I signed up for it. And I joined EO, Entrepreneurs Organization, which is a is a, is a well-known organization for, for entrepreneurs, but cost to join $11,000. Holy fucking shit. Yeah. That's a lot of money. It's a lot, yeah. It's a lot of money to join, to join, right? Like, and then you have nothing. In the two months that I've that been a member, already three potential deals have come for me. I've been connected to four other people and I've gotten already so much insights in terms of, oh, this is how we should enter the US market. Oh, this is where I should look at. Oh, these are little intricacies, right? It's now being in it, right? It feels like a no brainer, but I waited yeah. two years before I was like willing to make that commitment. Yeah. I was at Mind Valley University last year in Estonia. Yeah. For three weeks and um i spent maybe three thousand dollars including the ticket i don't remember exactly but um 
I met one guy that I'm now uh, is kind of a client uh, slash I'm a co-founder because we're working on a search engine for train travel instead of plane travel. Yeah. And he's like the, the CEO. I'm like 10% and I, I make some revenues out of it. Yeah. But I was thinking that one encounter, uh, I earned back, let's say, the investment in Mind Valley. But for some people, it might sound counterintuitive. You're going to a three week conference. Like, people are like, a three week conference. Conferences are supposed to be two days, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like, let's go. But I don't, in a way, I don't look at it like that so rationally. But on the other hand, it's also part of my intuitive uh, sense that I go to certain places where you meet opportunity. Um, yeah, so it, it, it is it is quite interesting. But then where is the, the limit? Because yeah, then you spend 10K, but then there's also these groups where you, you pay 25K and 100K. So how do you... <laughs> How do you define again your your limit? I mean, it's still your wallet, right? I could never afford in this stage of life a hundred k, right? And the no. people that are that are that are hanging there, they're flying private most likely, right? Like yeah. they're gonna like, oh, and I'm 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 literally right now because tickets are so expensive. I'm flying indirect back to Amsterdam, yeah. right? Like I don't yeah. because I it was a seven hundred euro difference between an economy ticket indirect versus direct, right? So <laughs> it's not like I'm have have piles of cash laying here no like, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm really doing pros and cons i still have like an iphone 10 that my stepdaughter makes fun of me because yeah. my phone is so crappy right like yeah. it's again it's this weird relationship with money what you spend your your your, your money on so, so that's yeah. the trade-off that you need to make follow your intuition and you have tons of these new york there's so much money here right you really got to watch out that you don't get sucked into it's like i want to have a bigger better vacation and cooler yeah. things and cooler experiences right that, that is really your own trade-off I understand. So you have to define uh, what you like and then make make these types of decisions. Um, I'm curious also the journey. You're Dutch. I mean, you lived in the Netherlands, then you went to Ukraine, you went to New York. Quite some remarkable steps uh, that you have made. Uh, but what were some of the uh, challenges in these transformations? Uh, what what were maybe some things you had to let go of to to make all these transitions? Yeah, so I, I I lived for eight years in Amsterdam, and then I decided to uh, start my uh, recruitment outsourcing company in, in Kiev, Ukraine. So I moved in October 2018 to Kiev, never lived or worked there, let alone set up a company, right? So on every single aspect, there was a huge, huge, huge change. I was challenged on every front, language, food, people, no network. I had to build everything from the ground up, and I was starting a business, right, in this, in this, in this foreign environment where I also had never started a business from scratch in a field that I knew, but not was an expert in. So yeah, that first year, that, that's been my year of the, of the biggest growth. But the, the actually what, in hindsight, what worked well for me because I didn't have a network or any distractions, the only thing I did in Kiev, I, would, I worked. Mm -hmm. Worked, worked, worked. I was doing 80 to 90 to 100, 100 hour work weeks, just focused on the business. I literally in the weekends was like happy that I didn't have anything in my schedule because I was, so exhausted from the week of like super long days yeah on the weekend i would give myself i would buy myself like lunch somewhere by myself and it would go back at it again right like that <laughs> really was 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 what my almost like my first year uh, looked like and that was a that was a big transition but that ca that gave me in the end right that's that's those are the seeds that that um uh, eventually grew to to where metro is now that gave me then eventually the opportunity and the comfort to to move to new york and be able to afford and live uh, live in new york and new york was a very different challenge because i didn't have a community um especially compared to new york standards i i had to watch my cost much uh, much better than some of some of the people i was i was hanging out with and because new york is such a transit city you really have to kind of like reinvent yourself it's like hey what do you bring to the table like what's your story right um and and, and the different people that uh, that are here so 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 those were kind of like the the little transitions i uh, i had i can imagine but in ukraine you definitely prioritize your uh your business and did you let go of the netherlands like um uh, in uh, at some point or you kind of kept kept the relationship because in my journey at some point i kind of decided to let go a little bit more to be a bit more free but how has that been been for you no, I'm I'm still very tied to to Nilla. So I'm I'm I've always uh, deliberately and and consciously um, kept investing in, in in my relationships, even though I've been out of out of the Netherlands for the for, for the last five years, um, to make sure that I know what's going on with uh, with my friends. Um, I'm very close with uh, with with my parents, so I, I make sure that every three to four months I I get to see them. I speak to them every week, right? So 
it, it takes time and it definitely distracts from from being present in 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 either ukraine or or, or new york where i've lived but to me it, it brings me a lot right so so i i find that find it important that i still cultivate those uh, those friendships yeah uh that's um that's beautiful and important. I, I'm realizing that, of course, I do cultivate relationships with my my, my parents. But I think yeah. I meant a little bit of psychological, like not always being wanting to be in, in, in two places. Is there anything that we forgot to um, uh, discuss or any other uh, topic uh, that that bring that comes to your mind that you'd like to share with the listener? No, I think I think uh, I think that's uh, that's it. I'm I'm very grateful. I was I was honestly surprised, but also humbled and excited when you reached out to to have this have this conversation, Jasper. So I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for for being here, and I really enjoyed the conversation. I was also touched uh, by what you shared uh, earlier about uh, not becoming a father. Really interested to learn from all your goal setting tools, the reflection on doing versus being. And so we keep evolving, right? Once you achieve something, like the next thing yeah. comes. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for your time. And um, I hope to see you at some Burning Man or somewhere else. Jasper, all the best. Thank <laughs> you so much. <laughs> oh, and the last one. Boom. Leuk, man. <laughs> Ik vond het heel mooi. Wat vond jij ervan? Ja, leuk, man. Heel leuk. Heel leuk. Echt leuk om te doen. Ook veel leuk op mooie, goede flow en zo. Het is echt, uh, echt top, man. Ja, dat is cool, hè? Jij moet gaan, ja. geloof ik nu, hè? Ja, ik moet gaan. Ik zit een beetje ja. beter te komen. Laat ik ja, even zo. een seconde kijken waar die, waar, waar die joker...